Hello and welcome to lecture number 6. Today we will be looking at data mining which is one of the key enabler technologies for business analytics. And this lecture is based on chapter 5 from the textbook. Data mining can have different definitions but one of the standard definitions that is commonly used in the literature describes data mining as the non-trivial process of identifying valid novel, potentially useful, and ultimately understandable variants in data stored in structured databases. There's also many other names that are associated with data mining such as knowledge extraction, pattern analysis, data archaeology, information harvesting, pattern searching, and data bridging. As it can be seen from the figure here, data mining is not a new discipline per se but rather a new definition for the use of many disciplines. As you can see, data mining lies at the intersection between many disciplines, including statistics, artificial intelligence, machine learning, management science, information systems, and databases. And as we have seen over the past few weeks, data can come in different types of shapes. However, we holistically categorize data into two main categories. First one is structured data, and the second one is unstructured or semi-structured data. Given the definition we described earlier of data mining, we'll be focusing on the structured data only today, which can be classified into another subclasses, namely categorical and numerical. Categorical data represents the labels of multiple classes which are used to divide a variable into specific groups or a finite set of discrete values. While numeric values or numeric data on the other hand represent the numeric values of specific variables. The categorical data can be further subdivided into nominal or ordinal data, whereas numeric data can be subdivided into interval or ratio. We'll be describing each of these two types in the following. So nominal data contain measurements of simple codes that are assigned to objects as labels and they can be represented with either binomial values, which essentially having only two possible values. This could be something like yes or no or true or false or good or bad. Or it can also contain multinomial values, which could have three or more possible values, such as the marital status, for instance, which could be ranging from being single or married or divorced. Ordinal data, on the other hand, contains codes that are assigned to objects or events as labels that also represent the rank order among them. For instance, uh, a credit score, which can be generally categorized to be either low or medium or high, Similar ordered relationships can be seen in variables such as age group, which could be categorized into being child, young, or middle-aged, or elderly. Another type of ordinal data could be educational level, which could be ranging from uh, categories such as high school, college, or graduate school. Now we move to the numerical uh, type of structured data, which contains internally either interval or ratio data. The interval data are essentially variables that can be measured on interval scales. And one common example for this could be the temperature on the Celsius uh, scale, while the ratio type of data could include measurements or, or variables that commonly found in physical sciences and engineering such as quantities or attributes such as mass, length, time, and energy. The way that data mining works can be simply viewed as extraction of prominent patterns from large amount of data, and those patterns are essentially mathematical relationships between data items. Generally speaking, we can find that data mining seeks to identify four major types of patterns, namely association, prediction, clustering, and finally, sequential or time series relationships. In associations, it tries to find the commonly co-occurring groupings of things, and this could be helpful in recommendation systems that are commonly used in e-commerce websites. 
Predictions, on the other hand, tries to tell the nature of future occurrences of certain events based on what has happened in the past, such as predicting the winner of the Super Bowl or forecasting the absolute temperature of a particular day. Clustering tries to identify natural groupings of things based on their known characteristics, such as assigning customers in different segments based on their demographics and past purchase behaviors. Finally, sequential relationships try to discover time orders events, such as predicting that an existing banking account customer who already has a checking account will open a savings account followed by an investment account within a year. More formally here, the data mining task can be organized as follows. Based on the previously described types of patterns and the way in which patterns are extracted, data mining methods can be classified as either supervised or unsupervised tasks. With supervised learning algorithm, the training data includes both descriptive attributes this could be something like independent variables or decision variables, as well as the class attribute, which is the, the average variable that need to be predicted. In contrast, with unsupervised learning, the training data includes only descriptive attributes without any class labels. And as you can see from the figure here, for each data mining operation, you will find a number of tasks that belong to it such as the classification and regression task from the prediction operation, which are both a supervised learning methods, or the outlier analysis from the clustering operation, which is an unsupervised learning method. In the following, a number of the domains and applications that utilize data mining. Let's look at one or two of those applications here. First one is the insurance industry. Nowadays, insurance companies are heavily using data mining techniques in order to do things such as predicting which customers are more likely to buy new policies with special features, or to identify and prevent incorrect claim payments and fraudulent activities. Another application of data mining is in the retailing industry, where data mining are used to predict accurate sales volumes at specific retail locations, and this is usually helpful to determine correct inventory levels, or data mining can be used also in the retail industry to identify sales relationships between different products, and this is usually helpful to improve the store layout and optimize sales promotions. Here we look at some of the processes that are commonly followed when carrying out any data mining project. So data mining processes, similar to any with established processes, are commonly based on best of practices done by researchers and practitioners, and that were proven to achieve successful outcomes, in our case here in conducting data mining projects. As we can see here, there are three main types of standardized processes for data mining projects. The first one, which is the, one of the most commonly utilized data mining processes, uh, in, in practice and in the, in the industry is called CRESP-DM, which stands for the Cross-Industry Standard Process for Data Mining, which was proposed in the mid-90s by a European consortium of companies. The CRESP-DM process involved the following sequence of six steps that start with a good understanding of the business and the need for the data mining projects and ends with the deployment of the solution that satisfies the specific business needs. One important thing to note as part of this visualization here that while these six steps are sequential in nature, but in reality, they are following more of an iterative cyclic process. And this is due to a number of reasons such as the complexity of the business problem or the knowledge and experience of the uh, business analysts who are involved in the process as well. But generally speaking, you will find that data mining projects following this process will include those main six steps. In the business understanding steps, the focus is more on knowing what would the study would be for and also the planning part of the projects which involves assigning people to collect data analyze it and report findings. While in the data understanding steps, the focus is on establishing the data sources and data types and performing some preliminary 
statistical or exploratory analysis to better understand the data. In the third step, this is where the data preparation operation is performed, which takes the data identified in the previous step and prepare it for analysis by data mining methods. And this preparation involved the outline subtask here, which ranged from data correlation to data reduction. As a result, and in reality, we can find that data pre-processing consumes most of the time and efforts, and most of people believe that this step accounts for roughly 80% of the total time spent on a data mining project. In the fourth step, this is where various modeling techniques are selected and applied to the already prepared dataset in order to address the specific business need. The model building step also includes the assessment and comparative analysis of the various models built. In the fifth step, the developed models are assessed and evaluated for their accuracy and applicability. This step assesses the degrees to which the selected model or models meet the business objectives and if so, to what extent. Finally, in step number six, the deployment phase is performed, which could be as simple as generating a report or as complex as implementing a repeatable data mining process across the enterprise. Here is another data mining process, which is called SEMA, which stands for Sample Explore Modify Model and Assess, and it was developed by the SAS Institute. As it can be shown here, SEMA starts with a statistically represented sample of the data, which makes it easy to apply exploratory statistical and visualization techniques, as well as selecting and transforming the most significant predictive variables, which can be used later by the models to predict and evaluate the outcomes. As we can see also from the figure here, the output from each stage allowed the developers or stakeholders to model new questions raised by the previous results and go back to the exploration phase to further refine the data. Another thing to note here, while SEMA follows an iterative approach similar to CRISP BM, however, they are quite different from each others. And this is because CRISP BM takes a more comprehensive approach, which includes understanding of the business and the relevant data to the data mining projects whereas SEMA implicitly assumed that the data mining project's goals and objectives, along with the appropriate data sources, have been identified and understood. Now, let's look in more details at one of the data mining methods, which is data classification. Data classification is one of the most frequently used data mining methods for real-world problems and it tries to categorize data or objects into predefined classes or categories based on their features or attributes. And given that the classification is a supervised learning method as we have shown earlier, this means that the classification algorithms or models need to be trained first on a labeled data set in order to be able to predict a class or category of new or unseen data. And once the model or the classification model is trained, the next step, as we have seen in the CRISP-DM process, is the model testing, which could be ranging from simple evaluation metrics, such as predictive accuracy or the hit rate, to more sophisticated assessment metrics, such as robustness, which refers to the model's ability to make reasonable, accurate predictions given noisy data as input. Here we look more closely at the different evaluation metrics for classification models. The basis for estimating the accuracy of any classification model is the confusion matrix, which is visualized here on the left hand side. You can think of the confusion matrix as a way to keep track of how many times a classification model produces correct and wrong predictions. In this particular confusion matrix here, it represents a two-class classification problem, or sometimes it's called binary classification problem, and this is because the output of the classification model can be only one of, of two potential classes, which is either true or false. And the way confusion matrix works is by keeping track of four different counters according to the output predicted class by the classification model. 
and those four counters are the confusion matrix fields here the first one on the upper left which is the true positive counters which is incremented whenever the classifier classifies an input sample as positive and it's really positive while the true negative counter which is incremented whenever the classifier classifies an input sample as negative and it's truly negative on the other hand the of diagonal counters here the false positive counter which classifies any input sample as positive and it's really negative while the false negative counter which classifies or incremented whenever it classifies an input sample as a negative and it's really a positive and here we have an example of a binary classification problem which is the pregnancy test and as you can see how the true positive and true negative and false positive and false negative occurrences could happen according to this example once the confusion matrix is constructed the following evaluation matrix on the right hand side can be easily calculated such as accuracy sensitivity or specificity or precision and recall evaluation metrics which are formally defined here here we have another assessment method of classification models which is called our area under the rock which stands for receiver operating characteristic area under the rock is a graphical assessment technique where the true positive rate is plotted on the y-axis while the false positive rate is plotted on the x-axis generally speaking the, the area under the rock curve determines the accuracy measure of a classifier where a value of one indicates a perfect classifier the on the other hand uh, a value of 0.5 indicates no better than random guessing classifier in reality the values of the area under the rock would range between these two extreme cases and as we can see here from the figure classifier a has a better classification performance than b while c is not any better than the random guessing of a flipping a coin we look here at another important aspect while constructing any classification model which is data splitting data splitting refers to the process of dividing the data you have into at least two parts one for the training the classification model and while the other part would be for testing or evaluating it one of the simplest data splitting strategy is to randomly allocate two-thirds of the data you have at the training set while the remaining one-third at the test set one exception though to this rule occurs when the classifier is an artificial neural networks type of classifier which in this case the data is partitioned into three subsets namely training validation and testing and here the new validation set is used during model training to prevent an issue often occurs during training artificial neural networks called overfitting which will be covered in more details as part of the lecture of next week Another common strategy for data splitting is called k-fold cross-validation which tries to overcome some of the bias that could be introduced by the random sampling of the two data splits in the sample split strategy and k-fold cross-validation strategy do so by randomly split the data into k mutually exclusive subsets of approximately equal size then it uses each subset as a testing while using the rest of the subset as training and it keeps repeating this process k times and based on the test results from each experiment they are aggregated to evaluate the overall prediction accuracy of the classification model there are also other strategies for data splitting such as leave one out bootstrapping and jackknifing which can be checked out in the textbook let's now go briefly over some of the classification techniques that are commonly used in data mining projects so the following list here just a sample of some of the most commonly used classification techniques and the first one is by far the most popular when it comes to structured data classification which is decision trees which is a, a part of the machine learning family of algorithms there is also the statistical analysis techniques which were the primary classification 
algorithms for many years until the emergence of machine learning techniques such as decision trees and in the statistical classification techniques it includes algorithms such as logistic regressions which make a number of assumptions about the input data and the relationship between the input and output variables such as the data need to be normally distribu distributed and the variables are not need to be not correlated and are independent of each others and because of such unrealistic assumptions it has led to the shift towards the machine learning techniques there is also artificial neural networks and support vector, vector machines or svms which uh, both will be covered in more details in the next week's lecture and there are also the Bayesian classifiers that use probability theory to build classification models based on the past occurrences that are capable of placing new instances into a most probable class or category. Now we'll be looking at cluster analysis, which is one of the other big areas of data mining methods. Cluster analysis, similar to classification techniques, is part of the machine learning family, but unlike classification techniques, it's a type of unsupervised learning methods which tries to automatically partition a collection of objects into natural groupings with similar features without access to any class labels data. And it's also often referred to as the segmentation technique. Here is some of the practical application of cluster analysis for data mining. As you can see, clustering has wide use cases that ranging from customer segmentation and market segmentation to identifying rare events or anomalies in different domains. Cluster analysis techniques can be also based on one or more of the following general methods. First one here is the statistical methods which includes both hierarchical and non-hierarchical approaches such as k-means and k-modes and other cluster analysis techniques uh, are the neural networks with the specialized types of architectures that can be used for cluster analysis and other types of cluster analysis techniques are fuzzy logic uh, more specifically fuzzy c-means algorithm which is a, a rule-based technique that, uh, uh, that assigns a probability of cluster membership rather than a, a crisp in or out as in the key means, which we'll be covering shortly in the following slides. And finally, genetic algorithm can be used also for cluster analysis. Here we'll be looking at one of the most widely used clustering algorithm, which is key means clustering algorithm. And k-means is best illustrated using the following example here. So let's say we want to take the unlabeled data set we have here and we want to group the data into two main clusters. So if we run the k-means cluster algorithm, here's what we are going to do. The first step is to randomly initialize two points and these two points are called cluster centroids which are visualized here in blue and red. And we have two of them here because we want to group the data here into two clusters as we have mentioned earlier. And since that key means it, an iterative algorithm, internally it does two things. The first one is called cluster assignment step and the second one is called a move centroid step. In the cluster assignment step, k-means is going to go through each of the examples uh, we have here visualized in green and depending whether uh, the, these points are closer to the red uh, cluster centroid or the blue cluster centroid, it is going to assign all of the data points to one of these two cluster centroids. Specifically, what's meant be, uh, by that, that it will go through uh, all of our data set and color each of the points either red or blue based on its proximity to either the red or the blue cluster centroids. So that's what the cluster assignment step and the other part of k-means which is the move centroid step which will take the two cluster centroids, the red and blue cross centroids and move them to the average of the points colored the same color. So one way to do this is to look at the 
red points and compute the average, which is essentially the mean of all the location of red points, and move the red cross centroid there, and do the same thing for the blue cross centroid, which will result in the following visualization. So, as you can see, each cluster centroid has new means now. And we repeat the previous two steps again and again until we are done like that or until the cluster centroid location is not moved anymore. And at this stage, we say that the key means has converged. And here are the former steps of the key means cluster algorithm according to our previous visualization. And for some additional resources on key means, please feel free to check out the listed resources here, which are not accessible. Now let's move to another important data mining method, which is association rules. Association rules, or also known as market basket analysis, is one of the popular data mining methods that aims to find interesting relationships or affinities between variables or items in large databases. It's also part of the machine learning techniques and employ unsupervised learning similar to cluster analysis. Here we look at one of the examples of and use cases of association rule mining. Let's imagine we have an input point of sale transaction data, just like the content of a purchase receipt, where a number of products or services purchased together are tabulated under a single transaction instance. The expected analysis outcome using association rules mining would be some valuable information that can be used to better understand customer purchase behavior. For example, identifying that 70% of the customer who buy laptop computers and virus protection software also buy extended service plan. So in this case, the business can take advantage of such insights to take actions such as promoting those items as a package to maximize the profit from future similar transaction. So this is one of the prime examples of the benefits of utilizing association rule mining method in, in reality. Internally, association rule mining techniques rely on two common metrics in order to identify whether some of the association rules between different elements would be useful or not. These two metrics are called support and confidence, which follows the generic rule of formula shown here. This formula has two main parts, X and Y, which are called also the left-hand side and right-hand side, which represents the products or services you would like to study whether they have some association or not. And support here, according to this formula, corresponds to the percentage of how often X and Y go together, while confidence corresponds to the percentage of how often Y goes together with X. For Anderson, the example we had here at, at the bottom, uh, relates to the previous slide example, which can be represented uh, in this way according to this rule. Here we look at some of the common methods that are not true about data mining in general. And we have here the first one is that data mining what provides innocent solution and predictions. And of course, this is uh, a math not true because data mining, as we have shown in previous slides, is a multi-step process that requires deliberate and proactive design and use cases. The th second myth we have here is that data mining is not yet viable for business application. This is also not correct because the current state of the art data mining solution are ready to go for almost any business. Third myth is that data mining requires a separate or dedicated database. This isn't the case as well anymore because of the advances happening nowadays in database technology. So a dedicated database is not required, even though it might be desirable in some use cases. The fourth myth here is that data mining can only be done by those with advanced degrees. And this is certainly not true since newer web and cloud-based data mining tools nowadays can, ena can enable managers of all educational backgrounds to do data mining without any problems. 
fifth and final myth here is that data mining is only for large firms that have lots of customer data. And this is also another myth because it's not always about the quantity, but rather the quality of the data. So if the data accurately reflect the business or its customer. So any company of any size can be using data mining techniques. So this was the end of our lecture today. Thank you.